First of all, welcome to the State Historical Society. I'm very glad you came out to help us celebrate our 160th anniversary. It was January 28th in 1857 that the legislature gave us our first appropriation. The following week, a group of people, mostly men, got together and wrote the Constitution, which was on February 7th of 1857. The uh, Constitution's on display in the front lobby case if you look at it. But we're really glad you're here today. I have really lined up a great group of people, very talented people. I'm in awe of them. So I'm going to give you some quick introductions as to how to navigate the day and to get through things. Um, but I want to start out by thanking our sponsors. Iowa Federation of Labor, AFL-CIO, the Iowa Labor History Society, and the Friends of Historic Preservation are the people bringing you Bob Black and the Banjos here at 3 o'clock. We also had support from the Iowa City Genealogical Society, Deluxe Cakes and Pastries, some of the best in town, and a, a couple of private donors. We're also grateful to Ty Coleman and his crew at the Iowa City Government TV Channel 4 for recording portions of this program for broadcast and later online access. They've been a great team with us for a number of years, uh, partnering to document our History for Lunch lectures, which are also still available in their archive. I want to thank some of our volunteers who I'm going to talk about in a minute for taking the time to come in here today and talk about some of the collections that they've fallen in love with. This building is really a treasure trove of documentary evidence about Iowa and the upper Midwest. I want to thank Charles Scott for the technical setups and putting signs around. Uh, Allison Woods and Randall Schrader and Marv Bergman were also at my side helping me. In particular, I want to mention Joni Hindman, Paul Jewell, Jamie Baranek, uh, Roland Wainer, John McCurley, and some of the other people that you're going to meet as you go around the building today. I also want to thank Shelby Woods, who's a young undergraduate at the University of Iowa who helped design our flyer. Um, the way this is going to go is I'm going to cede this microphone to our first lecturer, which is Rebecca Conard. She will be done probably around 1.30 or a little bit after that. And then we invite you to roam around the building and go to these various stations we've set up and talk to the individuals who are there and learn something about our collections. Those people will also be available around 2.45. You can wander in those areas anytime, but if you want to talk to those people, it would be at 1.30 and 2.45. At 3 o'clock, we're going to kind of close down and have some cake and refreshments and enjoy some good music. One of the exciting things about the music, I'm going to introduce them now. Uh, Bob Black, I'm very humbled by him. He's an incredible musician. He played with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys for many years. Uh, in 2002, he received the Traditional Arts Award from the Iowa Arts Council. His playing and singing can be heard on well over 40 albums, dating back to 1973. When I was just 18, I used to go down to Bart's and dance to Bob Black and the people that were in his band. Uh, he plays with the Banjoys, which include Christy Black, Mark Wilson, and Paul Roberts. The reason I'm showing you this book is it's something you can find in our library. And this is a memoir he wrote of his years playing with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. So this is an Iowan who took the national and international stage, but has come back to live over here in the English River Valley. And what he's done is he's partnered with a guy named Dave Jackson. They've written some songs about an Iowa ghost town. <coughs> Won't you take me to Hinkletown? And this is the book Dave Jackson did. <laughs> so that's local history at its finest. It's like the Brooklyn telephone book only for Hinkletown. <laughs> so at any rate, I may not get a chance to in introduce him later, but I want to encourage you to come back at 3 o'clock because they're very exceptional musicians. I'm right now going to introduce you to Rebecca Connor. She's a native Iowan, and uh, I'm going to get this part wrong. <laughs> She's Professor Emeriti at the, of History and the di former director of the Public History Program at Middle Tennessee State University. She's contributed many books on, and articles on topics related to environmental history, historic preservation, public history education, and interpretations of local, state, and regional history. Even though most of her professional career was spent outside Iowa, I've actually known Rebecca since about 1978 or 79, because she launched some really interesting oral history projects. One of them was under the auspices of Earthwatch, 
where they interviewed over 100 century farm owners and documented transitions in family farming in Iowa. And those are used every month, every day. Those are one of our most popular collections. She also interviewed people who were involved in the early conservation movement in Iowa, and those oral histories are in back here in the archives. Connor earned her Bachelor of Science degree from California State Polytech University and her master's from UCLA before receiving her PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1984. Among her Iowa-related books are Places of Quiet Beauty, Parks, Preserves, and Environmentalism, and Benjamin Shambaugh and the Intellectual Foundations of Public History, both published by the University of Iowa Press. Please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Rebecca to tell us a little bit about Benjamin Shambaugh. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and um, welcome. Um, I'm really delighted to be here uh, to celebrate the 160th and um, to talk about one of my favorite people, Benjamin Shambaugh, um, a name that's known probably to many or most of you in this room. Um, and for good reason. And really, uh, because my beat has been public history since uh, the late 1970s, um, and probably before that, really. I think it started with the State Historical Society in the middle 1970s. That's really kind of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to focus on Benjamin Shambaugh and inventing um, applied history, as he called it. And when I sat down today to kind of think about what I wanted to talk about and how I wanted to approach this, um, I thought of it, maybe it would be good to put myself back into 1917, 100 years ago. Shambaugh wasn't alive 160 years ago, but he was 100 years ago. And he was really kind of in the midst of figuring out what applied history meant um, in practice. And so that turned out to be kind of a useful exercise. And so 1917 becomes kind of my pivot point for this talk. Um, but before I do that, I need to kind of go back a little bit earlier. Shambaugh actually coined the term applied history in 1909, and I do mean coined that term. He really invented that term. Um, and it's a term that I think on the surface at least seems to be self-evident. Um, so I'm going to di digress a little bit before we get to 1917. So when he coined that term in 1909, he described it as, quote, the natural outcome of scientific history. Um, so we need to talk about scientific history a little bit. Like all university-educated historians at the time, Shambaugh was thoroughly trained in the uh, methods of scientific history, which largely meant kind of very rigorous research and documentation standards. We don't need to go any farther than that. Um, he also gravitated to a school of thought known as new history, which is sometimes called progressive history. But new history tried to do several things. It was kind of the new thing in history at the time. The idea was to move, widen the scope of historical inquiry beyond political and military history, which is kind of where history was stuck in 1900. Um, they also wanted, new historians wanted to incorporate the methods and sources of the social sciences, which were pretty new at the time. And above all, new history <coughs> thought it could yoke the um, study of history to serving the needs of contemporary society. Not very many people knew how that would be done, but Benjamin Shambaugh was the person who decided to really figure out what that meant. Um, so he spent his career kind of working out applied history, I like to think. I want to point out that Shambaugh was not alone in this quest. He belonged to a cadre of pretty young scholars at the time who were instrumental in creating um, some important outreach dimensions of the American Historical Society. He was um, part of the AHA Public Archives Commission, which later spun off and became the Society of American Archivists. 
He also was a co-founder of the AHA Conference on State and Local Historical Societies, and that also spun off many years later and became the American Association for State and Local History. Um, it was in the context of uh, working with historians within the AHA, um, with that outreach work that kind of brought him into regular contact with a number of like-minded historians who saw the work of history as being far more than just academic scholarship. That movement within the AHA also led to the formation of the Mississippi Valley Historical Association, which later became the Organization of American Historians. Shamba was president of that organization at one time. Um, and it also led to the formation of the American Political Science Association. He was also a founding member, former president of that organization, too. But so that's kind of the bigger picture in which he operated. But Iowa was Shamba's laboratory for applied history. And initially, that vision was shaped. Actually, I think it was also kind of limited by his chosen field of study, which was political economy. And he went to the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania for his doctorate. Applied history, as it was really in practice, would become issue-driven policy research for the state legis legislature. And that's what how he originally envisioned it. And toward that end, in 1909, he began to develop a research arm of the Historical Society. And by 1910, he was calling it the School of Iowa Research Historians. It had a mission, and that mission was to investigate state and local history in the solution of present day political, social, and economic problems. Comes straight out of new history, I think. It was funded by the state legislature. The whole historical society was funded. But he got extra money for this um, activity. And with that money, Shambaugh hired doctoral students, former students, colleagues at various colleges and universities. And they assisted the professional staff, which was growing in turning out a wide variety of policy studies. Some of these studies were published in the Iowa Journal of History and Politics, and others were published in an edited six-volume series known as the Applied History Series. Um, volume one, um, that was published between 1912 and 1930, that series. Volume one, for instance, included histories of road legislation, the regulation of urban utilities, primary elections, corrupt practices in legislation, work accident indemnity, and tax administration, all pertaining to the state of Iowa. It's, I will tell you, pretty deadly reading. But it was important stuff at the time. It was really kind of going out there. And, and he was, the, Wisconsin also was doing this, I will say. Um, there were two other series that complemented the Applied History series. They were the Economic History series and the Social History series. And um, honestly, if you look at them, it, it's hard to tell what distinguished one from the other. But they were all part of an expanding publications program um, at the Historical Society. And in any case, Policy history directed toward the work of the state legislature was what defined applied history at the Historical Society up until World War I. And that point is where Shambaugh's concept of applied history began to broaden, or at least he began to experiment more boldly. There is some evidence that he had these ideas, other ideas about applied history, and he was kind of doodling them, I would say. Um, but World War I kind of gave him an opportunity to expand applied history. I want to back up again and note that at the outset, uh, of when America became involved in World War I, um, there was a move to get all states to collect and preserve material um, on the uh, war effort on the home front, and the military really too, but mainly the home front. And about 35 states did this, and Iowa was among them. 
that effort was, the AHA was behind that effort as well and even um, established another spinoff, the um, Board um, of uh, National Board for Historical Service to kind of coordinate that. But Iowa was one of 35 states that did that. But under Shambaugh's direction, Iowa, the State H Historical Society, really took a very methodical approach. And one direction was an extension of the Applied History series. In early 1917, the Historical Society adopted a policy of documenting the state's collective um, war history. Uh, or service, and it would do that through organizations like the Red Cross, uh, the United War Work Campaign, other organizations, but it was really to kind of look at the state as a whole and encourage local historical societies to do the same for their communities, really. Then after the war, the historical society began drawing on that body of material to publish a special series, the Iowa Chronicles of the War, and I think there were six or seven volumes in all of that. And though that those publications really provided a very accessible public record of the welfare campaigns, the welfare work, the Red Cross, the Food Administration, and the sale of war bonds, among some other things. Um, but that was kind of the, the expansion of the Applied History series during the war. An entirely new direction is represented by a monthly pamphlet called Iowa and War. And that um, series ran short articles and was aimed at a much broader audience. And Shambaugh discovered they were really quite well received. This is one of those cases where Shambaugh apparently had been thinking about adding a popular history magazine to the publication line. And the Iowa and War series, the reception of that, demonstrated that there was viability. So he ran with that idea. And then in July of 1920, the society launched the Palimpsest, which I'm sure many of you in this room remember with great fondness, especially Jenna Lee. <laughs> um, but the PAL was aimed at making serious scholarship accessible to a general public through articles that were written in a narrative style, very unlike what you would read in the Applied History series. Um, and it would be kind of focused, these articles would be focused on single subjects. And then to reach an even broader audience, uh, the staff would take those articles and repackage them as smaller articles that were distributed to newspapers um, through a monthly bulletin that was called the Iowa History Items series. So those were the two big efforts of the war that then in the 1920s, um, from then on applied history, particularly during the 1920s, the applied history, Shamba would take that in two directions. One was that policy history and the other was popular history. Um, the applied history series continued, but now it was driven by what was truly a bold initiative known as the Iowa Commonwealth Conference. And this was really a big deal. Um, between 1923 and 1930, the Historical Society organized a series of conferences that were designed to function as forums for public, for civic discourse, not political debate but civic discourse on important issues that affected the state as a whole. The conferences um, later in the 1920s actually began to focus on national issues and bringing, again, kind of bringing that back to the state level. Participants included invited speakers and invited audience. And this was all by invitation and um, that was one of the things that I think made it work because it became a forum, that forum for bringing together political office holders, um, but also judges, attorneys, mayors, county supervisors, um, a faculty from various colleges and universities, public school teachers, administrators, and Im most important, I think it also brought in leaders from civic organizations. 
like the Farm Bureau and the Iowa Federation of Women's Clubs, the um, American Legion. So it was really a body that represented the whole of Iowa. It was held at the old uh, stone capitol right here in Iowa City. And it was held, the conferences were held during the summer session so that students could attend. Um, I've never found any evidence that students were, were, were presenters, but they certainly were encouraged to come and kind of sit in the per on the periphery and observe and study. Um, but it was probably the most ambitious thing that Shambaugh did during his time as, um, well, during his life, really, I would think. Um, the Historical Society also pursued um, popular history pretty aggressively. Uh, and I should stress that popular history always meant educational history, but for a general audience, you know, but a literate audience. The publications line was expanded to include historical memoirs, literary history, and later a biography series. And all of these publications appeared without footnotes. And I will say that uh, critics received them with kind of mixed feelings. Um, that was kind of a new direction at that time for a, histor a state historical society. Local history also received greater attention. And Shambaugh never really ignored local history. Actually, he was pretty, he thought it was quite important. But he always kept historical, local historical organizations at arm's length. He didn't really want to deal with them. Um, and that was true of most academics at that time. Uh, he preferred, for instance, to work with the Iowa Library Commission to produce materials on Iowa history that then would be distributed for study clubs. That was kind of the way he thought about uh, disseminating local history or promoting local history. But during the 1920s, the Historical Society became much more outreach oriented. Um, it collaborated with the Iowa Federation of Women's Clubs to launch Iowa History Week, which um, ran every April through 1938. Um, so it promoted historical activities for one week in the public schools. Um, and then the Historical Society also provided background material through the Palimpsest. Um, that is one of the forerunners of History Day, which uh, is a nationwide educational program right now. It runs year-round, actually, with a huge national competition. Um, but Iowa History Week and some similar initiatives like that are kind of the forerunners of History Day, which is now well beyond 40 years, I think. Um, the Historical Society also produced a weekly radio program, which was broadcast on WSUI. And it um, supported some archaeological investigations, a couple of important archaeological investigations, as well as a photo documentary study of the Iowa Meskwaki settlement uh, near Tama. Um, and staff at the Historical Society also began to travel around the state and speak to community groups. Uh, Ruth Gallagher, longtime staff member, was especially involved in this, which kind of laid the foundation for the field services program that emerged really in the post-war era, which Shambo wasn't part of. But the Historical Society staff was really beginning to move out into the communities around the state at that you know, in the 1920s. So during the 1920s, I think it's really fair to say that the Historical Society was a beehive of activity. There was a lot going on. Uh, unfortunately, the Great Depression, followed by kind of a redirection of resources during World War II, brought much of that to an end. Simply, there was no funding to carry out all of that. The biggest casualty, in my uh, estimation, was the Commonwealth Conference. The 1930 was the last conference. Um, and there was no funding for that afterwards. Um, and I say that it was the greatest loss. Shambaugh never really mourned that. But he honestly poured his heart and soul into that. And it was becoming a getting gaining national recognition toward the end of its run. Um, and I think when funding for that stopped is at the point at which Shambaugh really kind of began to lose steam. Um, 
And then he became further discouraged uh, when New Deal initiatives to employ white-collar workers uh, didn't really go the way they thought he should. Um, people at the state level in particular who were directing initiatives like the Federal Writers Project and the Historical Records Survey didn't really have the credentials or the experience to be leading those efforts, and he was he was really chagrined to find that there were there were no professionals who were really doing that. Um, that had been kind of his career was really promoting kind of professional history, but making it available to broader and broader audiences. So during the 1930s, Shambaugh increasingly retreated into academic life, where actually he found new inspiration for creating what became known as the campus course at the University of Iowa. He taught he was chairman of the political science department. I should have, for those of you who didn't know that, that's kind of an important piece of his career as well. Today, we would call that a capstone course, but it was known as the campus course. And every senior had to take that course it was, before they graduated. It was a way to kind of begin to amalgamate everything they had learned in their four years of study at the university. Shambaugh, unfortunately, died in 1940 um, at a time when the campus course, uh, uh, he was only 60, I think, at the time. Um, but he died as the campus course was becoming really popular on campus. The university actually created a library and a room for the campus course. It was only for the campus course. Um, and that untimely death and the popularity of the campus course then within the university community became what Shambaugh was remembered for primarily. And all of the secondarily for the tremendous output of work at the Historical Society that had been going on since 1907. Whether he would have rechanneled his tremendous energy and creativity into new initiatives for the Historical Society after the war is really one of those unanswerable questions. And I don't want to wander into what if territory. So I'm going to stop at this point, um, kind of go back and observe that in 1917, or really more accurately, World War I, was that point at which Shambaugh's concept of applied history began to change. What had been begun as an attempt to demonstrate the utility of history to state policymakers came to embrace during the 1920s much of what would later fall under the rubric of public history as that movement bubbled up in the 1970s. And the final thought I want to leave you with is that, um, and one of the things that inspired me to write this book, in addition to Mary, was that the leaders of the public history movement liked to think that they were creating a brand new field in the 1970s and even early 1980s. But in reality, they were standing on the shoulders of some true pioneers, as not only I, but many people have written about and um, talked about since then. But Shem Benjamin Shamba was one of the earliest pioneers, and in my estimation, one of the most important. And that is because he um, really is remains one of the few people who really looked at applied history as an extension of the profession as a whole. And for him, applied history didn't exist without the scholarship part. It was always the two together. Um, and that, I think, is what he brought to the State Historical Society, was a kind of integrity in the programs. Um, I don't know what he would think of public history today, and I'm not even sure I want to go there. But I think he was a tremendously important figure in the foundation of public history. So I did not take up the full half hour, and that was on purpose, because I know that some, many of you in this room know about Shambaugh. And there may be comments. And that would be great. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to entertain those. But um, we have, do we have a little bit of time? We do, okay. Let's give her a round of applause. Okay. All right. Thank you. But I want to hear from you for a little oh, bit, too. We'll take two or three questions. <clears throat> yeah. If somebody wants to, I want to hand you the mic. Does someone have a question for us? <clears throat> this 
might be for Mary as well as Rebecca. Yeah. What are some of the kinds of collecting initiatives that Shamba directed that right. enriched what we have here? I think Mary is probably better for that one. Well, I think one gold mine are the papers of territorial governor Robert Lucas. Those go back to the 1790s. But you can find uh, the fingerprints of Shamba all over this place. All the collections, anybody who was active in that period in these organizations she named, that's why we have those organizational records. And so he definitely left an imprint. Uh, but I think the scholarly underpinnings to everything he did are what made him so successful. And mm -hmm. we have to be reminded that you, you have to be able to dig deep to tell these stories and use complementary resources. And he did that by design. That's why we have newspapers and census and books and manuscripts so everything can be studied in concert. Good. Clearly, uh, Shambo was a force to be reckoned with in the state, and my question has to do with his political inclinations. Uh, I mean, he educated right. so many young people, he did. graduating from the University of Iowa, had a strong feeling about history. Did he try to influence, you know, partisan politics in any way or policy? No, as a matter of fact, and that's the story I didn't tell. Jan asked me if I was going to tell that story, and I did not. Actually, he, um, and that's one of the reasons that the State Historical Society remained in Iowa City until the, um, uh, government, the reorganization effort during Branstad's first administration. Because he actually was called to Des Moines to kind of organize the state library and archives. And at that time, Des Moines wanted to bring him to bring him from Iowa, wanted to get, tried to get him to move from Iowa City to Des Moines. And he did not because the very first appropriation for that went to political cronies. And he saw the handwriting on the wall and he said, no way. He wanted to develop this uh, legislative research arm of the Historical Society to provide information for policy making. And he did not want to get mired in the muck of politics. And he could do that from Iowa City because he had, you know, the connection with the University of Iowa. You know, he wasn't stranded. It was really embedded within the University of Iowa at that time. It was in Schaefer Hall. No. And I'll just add that he recruited people to write, like the history of road legislation right. in Iowa, the history of the third party movement, right. the history of the Mennonites in Iowa. I mean, he went out and created resources which are the starting point for anyone. Even if you're going to study a manna, you go to Bertha Shambaugh's book right. to study it. And poor Bertha got slighted here, but Benjamin yeah. wouldn't have been the success he was well, and really, without Bertha. And really, in public archaeology, he exactly. got its start under the state exactly. historical society. So they, they yeah. both deserve a round of applause. Yeah. I want to keep people moving here, but let's go ahead and give her another round of applause here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and if you'll bear with me for just a second, there are so many awesome people around here today, and one of them is Joan Liffring zug -Bure. I'm going to ask Joan to stand. As you walk around the building, you know, women doesn't like to announce her age, but Joan will be 88 in February. <laughs> and I've been working with her since the mid-80s, and her collection is unsurpassed in the state of Iowa. If the State Historical Society would have been able to hire a professional photographer 50-year period, it would have been Joan. She was tracing the artists, the ethnic groups, the industry in Iowa, and I hope that you enjoy these wonderful photographs she is. She's in the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. She has photos in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's an Iowan we should all be proud of. So let's thank Joan for being here today. with the State Historical Society because of Mary Bennett. I was so impressed when I heard her talk about Bertha Shambaugh that I said, I want Mary for me. <laughs> well, it's been an interesting journey. So let me tell you what else you can do here. First of all, enjoy Joan's photo. She'll be down in the conference room so you can chat with her. We have newspapers down in the library as well as our publications uh, that we'd like you to look at, possibly subscribe to the Annals of Iowa or become a member of the State Historical Society. Down on the mezzanine, which you'll have to go down the stairwell or get on the elevator, we have our World War II Clippings Project, which has been going on since 1995 due to dedicated volunteers. We have Roland Wainer, a top-notch architect. You see his buildings all over this town. 
and he's going to talk about our 26,000 sheets of architectural plans. John McCurley and I will answer questions about our labor collection. Paul Jewell will talk to you about historical photographs. And later at 4 o'clock, Dave Jackson will be telling you all about Hinkletown and his book. So please have a good time today. Enjoy what you see out. But most of all, come back. Come back when we have time to serve you. Bring your children in. Bring your parents in. Show them what a fantastic place this is. For me personally, it's a magical place. The first time I crossed those steps in 1974, I had no idea I'd still be standing here today. So <laughs> please excuse me. This is about the people who built this place, brick by brick, box by box, book by book, diary by diary. So please be respectful of all they've done for us and keep us going forward another 160 years. Thank you. Thank you.